Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, pump systems and in particular uh, different flow control methods of pump systems and how one might decide which may be a suitable um, flow control method and also what are some of the energy and cost implications of them as well. So uh, feel free to ask questions as we go through or save them to the end. Um, and that'll be okay. We just... Yep. <clears throat> okay. So I, I guess just a review as to why pump systems are important. Quite a large amount of industrial electricity demand uh, actually has to do with pumping in various forms, and and we've talked about this before. Uh, if 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 you've joined us. Um, previously for webinars we've talked a lot about oversizing and why pumps are oversized uh, but what you find internationally is that around 75% of industrial pumps are oversized and, and there's a number of reasons for that um, which we've talked about in depth in the past but that has quite some large implications on the energy use and part of that has to do with the methods that flow control the, the, the flow control methods that we use um, also go along with that as well and some of the other related reliability and maintenance problems that come with that. And, and so when you start looking at uh, energy reduction studies for example you tend to find quite large savings potentials um, due to this you know, amount of oversizing that's going on uh, both energy costs and also maintenance related costs as well. And it's important that when we look at pumps, that we look at the pump system. Rather than just looking at the individual pump itself, we look at the system. So the piping, the control system, what the use of the system is for, what's the requirement. It may be a cooling um, system, and we're pumping cooling fluid around, you know, or we're pumping, um, for example, our, our process fluids uh, through, our, through our process. So it's important that we consider what the system is and especially when we look at a flow control system, you know, what is the purpose of the system, how does it vary through time, we're going to talk a little bit about that today and you know, what's our ultimate goal of our system. Now I I've keep coming back to this um, almost in every webinar on, on pump systems, but it's, it's very important in this one here. There was a, a report done a few years ago out of Finland who assessed you know, almost 1,700 pump systems across multiple industries and multiple sites. And, and you can see the, um, the outcome there, you know, very low pump efficiencies on average, um, and a lot of that to, had to do with these two main factors, oversized pumps and throttled valves. <coughs> okay, and so when we oversize our pump, then if we have a throttling valve, then it becomes um, a, a huge portion of that inefficiency uh, is to do with that throttling valve because in order to run at the flow rate that we require, the throttling valve has to be you know, substantially closed. And so that has a lot of other implications, and we've talked about those um, flow implications or off-design operation, as, as we call it, in previous webinars. But that also has a, a flow-on effect into our maintenance and reliability. So, for example, <coughs> seal leakage, you can see there, was one of the main, uh, was the highest downtime cost. And you know that has to do with the additional forces that are created uh, within the pump due to the, um, the fluid mechanics when we have a highly throttled pump. Okay, so we have an oversized pump which then has to be throttled in order to achieve the flow rate that we require which then you know, has these other uh, flow on implications into our system. Okay, so flow control is an important um, system element that we need to consider and if we get this right it can help to size the pump correctly, but also then to have an efficient system that actually delivers in an efficient manner what we desire for it to do. Okay, so just a quick <coughs> revision. You know, we have a we have a pump curve, which is a um, 
property of the pump and the pump operates on that curve. It, it cannot move away from that unless we change something, say the impeller size or the speed, but we have an operating line for our pump called our pump curve. And then also superimposed on that we have our system curve which expresses the as a function of our flow rate what the head requirement is or the pressure drop through our system. And in this particular example here we have some static head that we have to overcome first in order to have a any flow within our system. And so where the system curve and the pump curve meet that is the operating point. And so if we want to operate at a different point we either have to alter our our pump curve so for example may we may change the speed or we need to alter our system curve and so we may add an additional pressure drop by using say a, a throttling valve in order to change the flow rate. And so when we look at our, our pump curve there's, there's also a, an efficiency point and so this best efficiency point or our BEP is the point at which our, if we operate at that point Okay, this point here, then we have the greatest efficiency. And as we move away from that best efficiency point, then our efficiency drops. And when designers design pumps and the, the flow through the pump and the impeller and the housing and all of those factors, to operate long term with reliability and efficiency, we actually ideally want to be in this preferred operating range which is typically between about 80 percent as the minimum so that's 80 percent of the flow at the best efficiency point up to about 110 percent of the flow at the best efficiency point for long-term operation we want to operate in that in that range there the pump will operate across a much wider range obviously however for <coughs> You know, long-term operation, we don't really want to be operating outside of that preferred operating range. There are a number of other factors that come into it, um, non-ideal flow conditions and things like that, which um, which then affect the performance and also the reliability of the pump. And so. And so when we operate outside of that range, then we refer to that as uh, off-design operation. And there was a, uh, a webinar a month or so ago um, which talked about <coughs> what actually happens inside the pump as we operate outside of, those, of that preferred operating range. Things like discharge uh, and suction recirculation things that go on inside the pump which have a negative effect for us. So that, that's available to go and have a look at um, on the ECA Business YouTube page, etc. Okay, so what, what we're going to talk about today in, in a bit more depth is, is really focus on flow control methods. Okay, so these are the ones that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about bypass control a throttle valve, a throttling valve control, um, size reduction and, and speed reduction as well um, and then also variable speed drive as a way to um, <coughs> control the speed of our pumps and therefore control the flow. Okay, So we'll just go through these in, uh, individually and then at the end I have an example to sort of illustrate what the, some of the cost implications are and when, you know, um, one of these might be more suitable than, than the other. Okay, so if we start off with bypass control, what this is is really a, it's, it's often not used for flow control as, as such, it's actually used to maintain the minimum flow rate through our pump. Okay, and so if we just <coughs> look at a pump curve uh, that we may get from a supplier, Obviously we have our, our pump curve and we have our efficiency lines, but if we just highlight this, this line here, usually you find a line which is the minimum flow rate that the pump 
needs to operate. It needs to operate above that minimum flow rate, um, otherwise you can have high pressure, <coughs> um, your, your system can see a high pressure, you may have a um, high temperature rise and things can start to go wrong pretty quickly. If it's not specified on the pump curve, often there is a, um, you know, some guidance around what that would be. You know, it might be, you know, 10 or 20 percent of the best efficiency flow rate or something like that. And so, what, how, why bypasses are often used is to make sure that if our demand in our system changes, then, and if it drops below that minimum flow, that the, that minimum flow is still maintained um, through the pump. And so, what that what happens is we re, we return a portion of the flow back uh, to our tank or to our system. <laughs> it may just go round and round, and that maintains that minimum flow rate through the pump. Now, there are a number of different ways to do this. Uh, you may just have a a continuous bypass which is operating all the time and so you, you may have a demand in your process that may exceed that minimum flow rate however you still may return quite a large proportion of that flow back um, in, in the bypass um, just the way that it's configured or you may have a control system on your bypass valve for example which then only operates when you actually need to have that. Obviously if you just have a continuous bypass that adds in a quite a large inefficiency into the system and so there'll be an energy implication uh, and a cost implication on the operation of that system. Adding in an automatic bypass will reduce that, um, cap uh, that um, operational expense um, but obviously there's a little bit more involved there with a, having a control system in order to, to operate that. And, and it's really inefficient in the fact that you're actually pumping more fluid than you need to um, for your process. However, in, in some systems it's really important to make sure that that minimum flow rate is maintained and so it is still commonly used in order to provide that, um, that, that function. However, often I've seen it done in a very inefficient manner and so having some sort of control on that bypass can improve the efficiency quite a lot um, while still maintaining uh, the option to have that bypass. Great, thanks James. Yeah, that, that's an important point to make, is, is firstly, you know, this, these are often there to protect the pump and to protect the system, and so they need to make, you know, they need to operate correctly, um, <clears throat> but also they can be an important safety uh, mechanism as well as part of your system or your process safety as well. And so, you know, they do have their place, but if you're only really using them to control your flow to the process, then that it's not really a <coughs> the, the best method to use and, and you're going to pay for that um, with quite some large inefficiencies in the system. But for, for minimum flow control protection, you know, they, they have their place and they are still commonly used for that. Okay, so if we go to our next method, um, which is uh, throttle control or using a valve to control the flow rate, uh, it's, it's still very common. And, and it's you know it works fine, but there are some potential for large inefficiencies in a number of situations. Okay, 
first of all if you have a oversized pump which as we said before is quite common you know often there are additional safety factors and uncertainties put in at the design stage or the specification stage of the pump and so people tend to get the next size up and things like that and so in order to deliver the, fro the flow rate that's actually required by the process then the, the, the control valve is, is highly throttled uh, in order to maintain that and that has a number of different um, implications and so you end up moving outside of that preferred operating range on your pump curve. The other place where there's large inefficiencies is if you have a very variable demand in your flow rate for example and, and we'll see that later on and so what you're trying to do is use the valve to control the flow rate and if that's highly variable then that can introduce some large inefficiencies into the system and so we'll talk about variable speed drives and they tend to be more suitable where you have a variable demand however throttle control are excellent and, and typically the most effective if you have a constant or fairly constant flow rate within a very narrow band and you correctly size your pump. If you don't correctly size your pump then you're going to add in this very large inefficiency you won't be operating near the pump's best efficiency point and you're basically wasting energy. Whereas if you correctly size the pump, you can have your system or your pump operating at the best efficiency point or very close to that in that preferred operating range and you can have a very efficient system with a control valve there. Okay, so if we have a look at what the different elements are um, for a flow control system using a valve, okay, we have our, we have our pump. First of all, there'll be some sort of measurement device, say a, a flow meter for example, which measures the flow. That will then send that signal to a controller, which will compare it to a, a set point. And then there'll be a control element, which is the control valve, which will then be adjusted in order to maintain or, or to achieve the desired flow rate. Okay, so it, it's pretty straightforward and typically a globe valve is used as the control valve or the final control element is typically a, a, a globe valve is used although there are others depending on uh, the situation. So if we look at what actually happens to our system curve when we have a, um, a control valve, so here we've got our, the black line is our our pump curve and if we're at 150 let me just get our pin here if we're at this point here with the valve fully open and we need 150 cubes per hour then that is where we're going to operate if we want to reduce our flow rate at all then what we have to do in this case we're not going to change we can't manipulate our um, pump curve in any way and so we only can manipulate our our system curve which is that red line so as we close the valve then our pressure drop in our system goes up and we reduce our flow rate by closing the valve and so we manipulate the flow by closing the valve not all the way it'll obviously turn it off but we we can manipulate the flow rate and our pressure in our system goes up and our system curve changes and we get to a new operating point. Now what happens there is by increasing that pressure drop or that head, what actually happens if we've left our valve open, okay, if we, if we had our original system curve then this additional head from here to here is actually the head delivered by our our valve. Okay, so you can see there that you know there's a large increase or large pressure drop due to the valve which then affects the flow rate. If we have a system which has some static head to start with, then <coughs> 
obviously to reduce our flow rate from 150 to 75 cubes per hour or to cut it in half we then close our valve and we have a slightly less um, pressure drop due to, due to our valve. And so how open or closed that valve is, is dependent on the type of valve that we use and its, its characteristics. So here's our, our valve here and typically there's a, a seat and a disc and as the valve is opened or closed then obviously the gap between the disc and the seat is, is varied and depending on the shape of the disc and the seat then we can have different types of valve characteristics so for example a linear valve the maximum flow is just linear, linearly proportional to the amount that it's traveled the amount that the disc is raised or lowered however we could have a quick opening valve so we have a small amount of travel or movement in the um, in the disc and then we have quite a large amount of flow that goes through the system or we could have an equal percentage valve which has you know we can move it a long way before we have a large change in the flow rate and so understanding it, you know if we just say oh a valve is 50% open or 50% closed it doesn't necessarily mean um, <coughs> that we're at 50% of the flow through the valve we need to understand the, the characteristics and the type of valve that we have in order to understand that relationship. Okay, so we've touched upon some of these. There are some real chances of having some um, negative effects from having a control using a throttling valve. Um, there is this potential, as we mentioned before, for these large inefficiencies. So energy and reliability um, especially if we have a oversized pump. Also, too, our the characteristics of our valve. Uh, often, you know, depending on if the valve is going up or down, we have this valve stiction or hysteresis, and its behaviour is slightly different, whether it's going up or down, um, and where it is on on your curve. And that then introduces um, control loop tuning problems as well. Okay, so if you have PID control, okay, having from from your flow meter back to your controller back to the valve, then tuning that can give you some problems, and often the valve can be <coughs> the weak link in that control system. You know, valves can play up and things like that. So that's the main disadvantages with with using a throttling valve, especially where you have a large flow rate variation and an oversized pump, you can have some quite large uh, inefficiencies introduced into your system. And we'll see that later on when we go through an example. The other way, and this is becoming more common, uh, is to reduce the speed of the, of the pump using a variable speed drive. And so this, from a control point of view, you can get very good and accurate control because what you're doing is manipulating the pump curve in order to meet the, out, the demand. Okay, so when you have a system which has a high a variable um, flow rate or demand, then this can give you very good control and tends to be <coughs> the most efficient option. However, Obviously now there's an additional element um, that you need to, to purchase. You need to buy a variable speed drive um, and depending on the size of your pump <laughs> and your motor that can be quite a large capital cost. The other thing though along with that the drives now are much more, they, they do a lot more than just you know run the motor. They actually have some very sophisticated control options in there that can be used as well. And so they, they become quite useful and they become very flexible uh, and, and a very good option in many cases. So if we just look at what the control system is, you would have some form of measurement, say a flow rate measurement for example, that will then send 
your signal or the flow rate back to the speed controller, in this case the variable speed drive, which is also the controller as well, and it has control elements in there, which then regulates the, um, the, f the speed of the motor and therefore the flow rate of the pump. And depending on the system that you have, there are a number of different options. So before we just had a simple flow control, you measure the flow because that's what you, you want to control. <coughs> However, you may use this for say a constant pressure control system. So at the top there, you may have a number of different users and what you want to maintain is the pressure of the system. <coughs> and so as users come on and off, what happens is the pressure of the system would be measured. That pressure then is returned back to the, the variable speed drive, compares it with the set point. You know, we want the pressure to be this, and if it deviates, then obviously the pump would run or speed up <coughs> and then maintain the pressure uh, to the system. Okay, so we can have a constant pressure control with a variable speed drive, and we may also measure something else that's not a flow or a pressure and, and control that particular um, variable. So for example, below we have a, a, a cooling system where you have a heat exchanger with a cooling demand and you've got cooling water operating going around and around. Now that cooling demand may vary due to the process that it's at and so what you're actually interested in is maintaining uh, that cooling demand, <coughs> so you may decide I'm going to measure and control to my out my cooling water temperature after the heat exchanger. And so that may be say 50 degrees, you measure that temperature, that then goes back to the speed controller and that will obviously increase or decrease the, the speed of the pump depending on the temperature set point that you, you've decided to, to have and maintain. And so as your process or your cooling demand changes in, in load, then the system will automatically control <laughs> to that particular temperature. And you're doing that by changing the flow rate, obviously, but it becomes a useful tool, this variable speed drive, in order to do that. Okay, so if we just look at what happens, uh, if we, here we have our... Our red line is our system curve, and if, let me just get my pen, now if, if we start up here, we have the speed of our, our pump, okay, so 1470 RPM, and we're going to be at 150 uh, cubes per hour. If we wish to reduce our flow rate, then what happens is the speed of the motor changes, and the whole pump curve shifts up and down depending on the speed. So as we reduce our speed to 1250, then our new operating point will shift to here. This is our new pump curve and we'll be operating at 125 cubes per hour and so on and so forth. <coughs> and so instead of manipulating our system curve to control our flow rate with a valve, we're actually manipulating the flow rate of our pump in order to achieve the flow rate that we desire. And often when you purchase a pump or you're looking at specifying a pump, um, you can get the curves as a function of the speed of the pump as well. That, that's fairly common um, to get. If you don't have that, then there are some methods to, to estimate what that would be. And if we have an open system, Okay, so we have <coughs> some static head that we have to overcome. Then this is just a, a thing to be aware of when you're using a variable speed drive in this particular case, is that there needs to be some, um, some checks in there because what this is showing that to get any flow rate, our pump has to deliver more than 25 meters of head. So if we slowed our pump to 1000 RPM, okay, it only the maximum head it delivers is just over 20, and so if we operated at 1000 RPM, there would be no flow in the system, but our pump would be going around and around. And so what that means is if you're using a variable speed drive 
in an open system with a static head that needs to be overcome, then you need to put some <coughs> some um, safeguards in there in order to prevent this sort of thing happening. Okay, so if we just can compare to remind ourselves what the the difference is between a control valve and a VSD is with our control valve we manipulated the system curve in order to reduce our flow rate whereas with the variable speed drive we manipulated the pump curve and our system curve stayed the same and so what I guess the upshot of all of this is that for a, a, a system that has a variable speed or a variable um, demand then uh, typically variable speed drives become uh, the preferred option. <coughs> now there are a number of um, issues that you have to work through with variable speed drives. There, there are other factors you need to consider um, with implementation. Uh, James gave a very good webinar a month or so ago on VSDs, the good, the bad, two months ago, um, the good, the bad and the ugly <coughs> and you know there are a number of other factors with implementing a variable speed drive that you have to consider um, and they're not sort of the cure-all uh, that, that people might think but you know in many cases those issues are worth uh, working through and the economics and the additional flexibility you can get uh, outweigh the other issues. Did you have any? Well. All right. No, if, as, as long as you do it well and, and take care of all the issues. I um, think you're muted, I think. Uh, from an energy point of view, the other the other thing to to point out is that by adding in uh, a variable speed drive, you're actually adding in another um, inefficiency, I guess. And typically, you know, your power usage across your VSD will increase by two two to three percent is the sort of typical rule of thumb. And so, but often that's outweighed by the the overall savings that you get um, compared to a control valve if you have a variable flow rate or an oversized pump. Okay, <clears throat> just before we get into our example, I've got a couple of other <coughs> flow manipulation methods. Um, they're not a true control method uh, because you have you can only do them offline. <coughs> so um, if you do have an oversized pump and but you have a, a fairly constant flow rate in your system, then instead of um, you know putting a variable speed drive in to simply drop the speed and then just having it run at a constant speed is another option to consider is having a impeller size reduction. Now obviously you have to take the impeller out and replace it or machine it back and and there's some things you have to work through and when you're doing this as well remembering you can't add material back onto your impeller and so you want to get this right, <coughs> otherwise it can be quite expensive. Um, but if, if you know what you're doing and you work through uh, this well, then this can be a very cost-effective method, especially if you have an oversized pump and a fairly constant flow rate um, for your process or your system. Um, and I'll probably plan on covering this in a little bit more depth than how you would trim an impeller and how we would estimate how much you need to do. There's some there's some rules or some guidelines there. Um, you don't want to have a mismatch between your impeller <coughs> and your housing. Um, but this is something to consider. But don't just run in and start hacking parts off your impeller. Things can go very wrong. The other sort of not a true control method but something that may be applicable is instead of <coughs> reducing the impeller size is if you have an indirect drive system then you can change your pulley sizes in order to reduce the speed of your pump 
and and that can be a very cost-effective way um, and once again only some situations it applies to and it's really only applicable where one you have an indirect drive system and two you have a constant flow rate <coughs> or a fairly constant flow rate um, for your process and so there's some things to work through in order to decide um, you know what <coughs> what um, speed you need to reduce it to but that that can be an important um, thing okay so <coughs> let's go through an example now uh, of you know what are the implications of different uh, control systems or methods in, in a real example so here we have our example we've just got a simple cooling uh, loop okay we have our, our a heat exchanger that I haven't shown the hot side of the heat exchanger <coughs> but we're providing cooling fluid to that heat exchanger and then that is being um, dumped into the atmosphere via a cooling tower and and so we have a closed system um, with our pump there and at the bottom of the um, of the slide we have our system curve okay so this relates our our head delivered or the head that we need our pump to deliver for a given flow rate for our system and in this particular case our maximum demand in our system is 150 cubes per hour and the minimum demand is 75 cubes per hour okay so we've, we'll look at our our flow um, profile later on and see the effect of that and so here is our pump curve for this particular case and at the moment it's operating at 1470 rpm and we have the, um, the largest impeller diameter 356 so this is our pump curve here Oop. that's our pump curve there and our lines of constant efficiency as well <coughs> and so if we just plot our our pump curve there in the black <coughs> and the power consumption over the different flow rates okay so there's our our two or the performance of our pump both in head and also the power consumption then we can look at what it will be at different different points <coughs> if we overlay our system curve with our valve 100 percent open so no flow control our maximum um, our maximum flow rate that we can get is 150 cubes per hour okay now <coughs> in order to reduce that to 75 remember we said our minimum flow rate that we need is 75 cubes per hour then we would have a control valve which would then manipulate our system curve and we would then move from um, from this point here to this point here so we can compare <coughs> both the head and the pump efficiency and therefore the power at the two different points so if we put that up there at 150 cubes per hour the pump is delivering <coughs> 40 meters of head our pump efficiency from our pump curve we is 73 percent and so therefore our power consumption will be 22.4 kilowatts now as we reduce our flow rate by using our valve the head <coughs> delivered by the pump increases it goes from 40 to 45.8 meters okay and if we go back to our pump curve our remember our efficiency drops as we move away from our best efficiency point and so our new pump efficiency at that new operating point is 55 percent and so our power now is 17 kilowatts and so at least we, we have our, an idea of what the power consumption is at both <coughs> these operating points okay and 
there's our power formula there. Um, the density of the fluid, G is gravity, H is the head delivered by the pump, Q is the flow rate, and then this bottom one is our pump efficiency. I've excluded things like motor and transmission efficiency and things like that just to simplify, but that's how you calculate power. Or you could read it off the power off the um, pump curve if, if it's available as well. <coughs> so if we look at our, our variable speed drive situation, then in this case we have our, our pump curve at its maximum speed. Okay, and, and that's where we have our 150 cubes per hour. And if we wanted to drop to 75 cubes per hour, we would have to <coughs> reduce the speed down to 750 RPM in order to um, maintain, get that flow rate. And our system curve would stay the same because we've not changed anything in our system. And so if we compare flow rate or the um, <coughs> sorry the power consumption and the speed at the two different operating points then what we see is at the maximum things are the same as before okay we have 22.4 kilowatts in power consumption okay I've ignored the losses across the VSD but <coughs> you could add those in if you wanted you could put another you know two or three percent there if you wanted to be a bit more accurate but at the lower flow rate at 75 cubes per hour, first of all to note that the pump efficiency <coughs> is is the same. Okay, that's that's a fairly valid assumption because what what's happened is as you scale down, <coughs> that best efficiency point tends to follow a parabolic curve, um, and so if you apply the affinity laws <coughs> and things like that then your pump efficiency isn't really changed too much. And so that, and, and typically in your, um, on your pump curves, if you do have them at different speeds, then you also have uh, your lines of constant efficiency, so you can read that off the manufacturer's curve if you have that available. Okay, our RPM is 750. Uh, and so therefore if we work out what our power consumption is, at that point our, we're only pulling 2.8 kilowatts at the same flow rate. <coughs> yeah, your mode efficiency is going to be somewhat affected. It doesn't tend to drop off too much. Um, sort of typically below 30% it starts to take a bit of a dive, but <coughs> you can if you really want to be accurate, there are some ways of estimating what the pump of uh, the motor efficiency is going to be, but at this sort of level, you know, you'll get the point. <coughs> it's all about how accurate you want to be. If James is right next to you, you know, you have to be a bit more accurate. <coughs> but, but anyway, um, but if we plot our power consumption versus flow rate for our two different cases, our two different methods, throttle control or valve control and our variable speed, then you can see that there's quite a big difference, especially at the lower flow rates of power consumption between <coughs> our variable speed and our, our valve there. And even if we add it in to be more accurate to keep James happy, a couple of percentage points on our, <coughs> on our power consumption of our VSD, you can see that there's still a very large difference between the two. Okay, so let's, <coughs> before I said that the, if you have a, a flow rate that doesn't change that much and you, and you size your pump correctly to operate at its best efficiency point, then <coughs> a throttle valve, you can see the power consumption is virtually the same. Now if you actually take into account the 2 or 3% losses across the VSD, and you operate it at that, then you actually have a slightly higher consumption um, with your VSD if you only operated at 150 cubes an hour consistently. Plus, as James will remind you, you also have um, additional modes of failure that can come into it because you have another piece of equipment um, that can fail. And, and VSDs do fail. We have some in the lab and we have 
some issues with them from time to time um, and so that's another consideration that has to be taken into account. Okay, so there's a question here. <coughs> Formula for... F okay, <coughs> I might come back to that question at the end there, Barry. Um, let me just have a <coughs> think about what the best way to answer that is. Um, but I, I, haven't, I won't forget, and I'll come back to that. <coughs> Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's just look at an example and what this means um, for the economics. So what we have here is just a, a flow profile for a day. Okay, so we've got our hours down below, 24 hours, and <coughs> we have our, our system. So at the top we have our flow rate over the day. So this is just a hypothetical example to illustrate my point. So you've got, for the first five hours of the day, you're operating at that lower flow rate of 75 cubes per hour. Okay, then things kick in, and you operate at the maximum for the next 10 hours, and then for the remainder of the day, you're back at your 75 <coughs> um, cubes per hour. Okay, so down the bottom, I've got the power consumption that we worked out for the two different cases. So the... I actually haven't. The, the dashed line is the variable speed drive and the um, orange line is the power consumption for the valve. And so as you can see there, obviously during the times where we're at the minimum flow rate, using a valve would be at much higher power consumptions than compared to the, <coughs> the VSD. So if we turn that into some some costs over a year and I've just simply assumed you know 10 cents a kilowatt hour and 365 days a year then over the year our VSD would consume almost ten thousand dollars in power whereas by using a control valve we'd be up at about seventeen and a half thousand dollars and so that makes a big difference in the total power consumption for one year between the two methods and in this case here it's almost eight thousand dollars and so you know that would more than justify I think in this particular case the cost of a VSD in order to change you know the speed of and, and reduce your power consumption during those um, those periods where you have low flow rate okay but but that's for that particular profile. Those costs are unique to that, to that profile. If we go to another example where let's just say in the morning or at the start of the day you have a couple of hours where you have the lower flow rate and then you operate continuously at the higher flow rate, then you can see we have a much different power consumption or flow profile. And so when you work out what the total power consumption is over the over this okay the values change because you have a different flow profile uh, but the VSD you're just over 18,000 and the control valve um, you're almost at 20,000 so the difference is much less because your flow profile is is very different okay it's more or less constant except for this you know couple of hours um, a day where you're operating at a reduced rate and so the difference is much less, and so economically you have to make the decision is does this justify looking at a VSD? And, and it still may do that. Um, there may be some other factors that you want to look at, but you know, if, you can, if you have a consistent flow profile or flow demand over very long periods of time, then typically a control valve is the way to go if, and, it's, and, and this is important, to, to get right if your pump is sized correctly and it's operating at that best efficiency point or very close to it. If you have a variable, a variable demand application where the flow rate changes, especially if there's quite large variations for quite large periods of time, then a variable speed drive is almost always the way to go. Obviously there's some implementation um, 
factors you have to work through in order to do that correctly, but those are the two, um, the two scenarios. Okay, so I guess to summarize, we're coming to the end of the webinar, is you really want to match the control method to the system and what the system is trying to deliver, and the flow variability is an important factor in determining which one is the best. Sizing pumps correctly is always important, no matter which method you use, but especially where you have a, a control valve, if that's the method you've gone down, then it's essential in, to size the pump correctly. Otherwise, all of these other issues, these inefficiencies and reliability will become a major concern. Okay, energy costs are important to consider. The capital cost. If you've got a variable speed drive, that's additional uh, equipment and capital cost. Um, and then, you know, what, how much control do you need of your system is an important um, thing to consider as well when deciding which is a flow control, <coughs> um, uh, yeah, which, which control method do you want to go and use. Okay, so there's some additional information. As I've mentioned in the past, um, ECA have helped, EMANS in, in conjunction with ECA have developed a pump systems auditing standard which is freely available and that has some good information uh, in as well, especially around you know, what things to look for when you're conducting an audit or an assessment of your system. Uh, I've got James's previous webinars around variable speed drives. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a process engineer, they work. How they work is a little bit of black magic to me, but um, you know there are a number of other things um, such as harmonics and all these things that when you're looking at implementing them are important to be aware of and to work through. And then the last one there, um, the US Department of Energy, they have a number of um, sort of guides that are freely available, but they have a very good one on variable speed pumping and goes through some of the um, some of these things that we've talked about and about how to successfully implement a, a successful project um, implementing variable speed drives and pump applications. Okay, so <coughs> future webinars. Um, our, in two weeks' time, James will be giving a webinar on fan system, duct design and system troubleshooting. And then after that, Another one from James on understanding water hammer and steam and condensate systems. Yeah, I just <coughs> got one more. Obviously, our eco business. Um, if you know, if you need advice, feel free to contact. If you want more information, contact us. Or there's also your your eco um, account manager. Um, and once again, just a reminder that these webinars, as well as past ones, are available via the ECA business website and they, they also have a ECA YouTube channel as well. Okay, so Barry's question was, uh, the fluid still has dynamic energy when leaving the pipe and this is not reflected by the formula, okay, as a question. So if I go back, let me just try and go back to um, that formula there. <coughs> okay, so this is the, the power formula for power consumption of your pump. Now, the thing is, if you think about your system, <coughs> where is the, um, the energy or the kinetic energy from your, your system coming from? And your pump is delivering, as the fluid comes into the pump, the pump is raising its head or its pressure. Okay, And so that, that's, that additional energy delivered to that, um, that fluid that's, that is affected by the power consumption. And so if, if you already have some energy coming in, it's only the additional energy that you're, you're delivering by the pump is, is what that 
<coughs> um, formula expresses. And so it's only an additional head increase. Okay, this is this is um, depending on if you have a closed system or an open system, it becomes um, you know your absolute pressures in your system is not really what's important. It's the additional head delivered by the pump. Um, and so the dynamic energy of the of the fluid coming in that that only has to really to do with <coughs> you know the absolute pressures in the system. Like, yeah. Are you actually mic'd up, Barry? Um, and and I, there's been an additional question along with that is, is does the fluid velocity become part of this calculation? <coughs> and, the, and the simple answer is no, it's not because um, if you think about the velocity through your pump, it's actually changing. Your impeller is actually increasing the velocity of the liquid <coughs> and then as that dynamic energy due to the velocity, as it goes out the discharge that is converted into static pressure or head. And so the velocity, it's all to do, the pump efficiency is really a function of the design of the pump, the impeller and the housing and all of that, and the and how efficiently it delivers the energy into, uh, into the fluid. And so this is where as you move away from your best efficiency point or you have a different flow rate, all of the flow conditions and the fluid mechanics in the pump are a, a, a different than what it was designed at its best efficiency point. And they typically design them to operate at, a, at that point and obviously they realize they're going to be operated over a wider range but um, you know the, the ideal flow or the most efficient flow or delivery of energy from the impeller to the fluid is different as you move away at a different flow rate. I can just jump in there, Martin. <laughs> yep. um, I think the, the key thing to remember is Um, the other the other comment when that was made before when I was talking about impeller trimming, 
um, <coughs> is about 3D printing and you know can you print some extra material back on <coughs> to your impeller if you've gone too far typically you can't but um, it, it does raise the point Gilbert you know you make a good point around you know the use of 3D printing in um, in sort of impeller manufacture and certainly I have seen some um, stuff going on overseas where you know if for spe especially for specialist applications the use of CFD and printing sort of one-off or, or more complicated geometries um, it, it does have its um, it does have its place and I think you'll see more of this sort of 3D printing slash additive manufacturing going on in the space especially for, for prototyping and things like that. Um, one of the challenges still is around the materials but you know as you say I've seen over in Tauranga they've got this um, flash 3D sintering titanium thing that goes goes on there um, and so I think as the technology improves and the costs come down you'll see a wider range of materials um, and certainly for some applications I, I think in the future um, yeah 3D printing will, will have its place um, but yeah it, it we'll see how where that goes and where it develops I think that the other point I think I'd just jump in there James and add, yeah, work with the suppliers, you know, the, the pump suppliers in my experience are very good, you know, they actually don't want to supply you an oversized pump, but the reason why oversized pumps are often supplied is because that's the specification that they're given, and, and there's a number of reasons for that, but if you work with them and help get their uh, input into, you know, flow control method, variable speed drives, making sure that's implemented correctly, then, you know, there's a lot of knowledge there from the suppliers which, you know, they're more than happy to to help get the right solution. Uh, and so that's an important point to make. Alright, so if, if you have any more questions, quickly uh, send them through. Um, we'll stay on the line for another minute or so. Otherwise, feel free to email those questions through. Um, Oh, there's a there's a question about whether we plan to do a webinar similar to this for fans. If if not, we can certainly take that on board and uh, and, and and look at that on the schedule by all means. Then um, I'll have to double check the schedule for you and get back to you. Um, but if not, rest assured, we will schedule one. Great. I will thank you for um, for your input and and for your attendance, and uh, have a good day.